guys, it's so good to meet both y'all. Thanks. Thank you very much. It, this is easy when it's a uh, cinematic masterpiece, and I do not just throw that term around. Uh, it's my favorite war film I've seen since Saving Private Ryan, so it's my favorite in the last 20 years. Uh, this is one of those films I really think I'll see at least 30 times throughout Whoa. the course of my life. Wow. Yeah. Wow, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, I, 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 I was expecting twice. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I really enjoyed it. So what I want to start with is I was curious if either of y'all have a personal connection to the film. Did anyone in your family maybe serve in World War One? Yeah, I, um, I read a book called The Western Front Diaries, and it's snippets of um, diary entries of the soldiers that fought in the war. And I actually found that my great-great-grandfather had a diary entry in that book. And uh, he talks about how he fought in the cavalry. And one day when he was in no man's land, he was shot and he was paralyzed. And he was basically bleeding out for four days. Um, he survived the war in the end. And he worked in the first poppy factory that opened in uh, London, in Richmond, until he died. And I'd read that book to sort of, you know, understand, you know, what the soldiers were going through. And I'd look at that as inspiration, and read about my granddad. Did your uh, family know that story prior to that, or? Um, my granddad did, but my mum and dad didn't, and neither did I. And I, f I think I, I don't think I would have ever found out about it unless I started this film, or you know, asked about the First World War. And that's one thing that I hope people take away from watching the film as well that it encourages them to look at their own ancestors and look into their, you know, history. Yeah, because I'm talking to Sam next, and he talks yeah. about his grandfather and how they used to discuss those stories. And for me, some of my favorite memories as a child was sitting down with my grandfather and him telling me the stories of World War II. Really? You know? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to talk about the training and not just the rehearsal process, mm -hmm. but I'm sure y'all did a lot of extensive training going into that because the way that you would fight or train for a World War I battle would be quite different than for other wars. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's one thing. That's why this story is... It's such a human story, I think, because all the, um, I mean, oh, of course, sorry, like, but all, um, you know, I think sometimes we think, when we think of these, anyone as, as soldiers, you forget that they're humans first and foremost. And I think even more so with these, these men, that they were not career soldiers, that this, this situation came about and they chose to go towards it or they were drafted. And, uh, and, and so they, they were less, um, less prepared, I guess, and they were sort of learning as they went. But and so therefore, as you say, the the military training that we got was um, was all you know period training of the time. Sim very simple stuff like how to salute, um, how you would carry your rifle, um, because that's the thing. As I think we we have an, a sense of, of like how we would do things, but you realise it's actually just from war movies that you've seen <laughs> and, and you know all re like ready, which you know, most of those have happened post the First World War. Mm -hmm. um, so we had an amazing military advisor called Paul Biddis, and, and and to be honest, most of this stuff because. There was, you know, the the sort of the drills. They wouldn't sort of. It was a different. It was a different kind of combat. It was just simply getting your hands around the kit, you know. So they carried everything on them, you know, in the webbing, you know, ammunition, um, how to clean and like load your rifle. It was just so that everything became second nature. Because in the story, there's not a huge amount of fighting you know yeah. Christy the writer put it beautifully where she said the, the biggest battle in this is to stop the battle and so it was just that we you know but as we're walking and talking and doing and got lots of things going on at once during the scenes that you're able to kind of yeah, like have a relationship with all your gear that is completely unconscious so that's where most of the training went yeah filming this had been quite immersive and I would say and I mean this like in the most uh, humbling way or whatever but it, it felt claustrophobic and I mean mm -hmm. that in a very positive way because you just feel so in depth with the story so with it being the continuous shot sequence what was it like filming that compared to anything else that you've worked on before um, claustrophobic <laughs> <laughs> no I mean it was it was really full-on I mean normally as an actor you you know you step onto set in front of an already set up camera and you know you have a 15, 20 minute break while they turn around, and there's there's actually a lot of waiting around. Whereas this, you know, there was no setups; it was just one camera, one angle, and uh, so we was constantly go go go. You know, it was either filming, or if we couldn't film with the weather, we'd be rehearsing, and it was very very intense. And, and we'd find ourselves, you know, doing the whole route, which is miles long, and then cutting, and then walking all the way back that same route 
talk to Sam, get a few notes and then do it again. And it would literally be on this conveyor belt of just constantly going through the First World War. Mm. You know, you found yourself being constantly in that headspace and some scenes would last nine, ten minutes long and you would be just completely lost and immersed in, in that story we were telling. It was amazing. Yeah, I was curious how long your longest continuous shot was and with you saying that, I'm sure as like say you're going through the trench and you're going through a corner, mm. once the guys are out of frame, I'm sure they're already probably already resetting behind you. Is that right or? It, um, it, most, most we would try and kind of keep the world of the take active always. Yeah. So I think because the camera was looking 360 degrees, of course there's sort of moments where you pass a corner and you know that you're out of sight. But, but oftentimes I think, part of the joy of it that everyone it was like a big performance for that 10 minutes that if before you even got to the play unless they were sort of waiting to come in people were doing the action before before you got to them because also you know you might hear like say your your character comes halfway through the shot you might hear three minutes before your your bit like action down the way <laughs> but if you're kind of just waiting and then all of a sudden they come around the corner you have to sort of be doing your you know your movement your action in that world um, beforehand, so it was kind of everyone existed for the whole 10 minutes, um, each take, I'd say. Sam, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's nice to be here. So, this film, uh, man, it was powerful. I brought a buddy of mine with me to see this film, and it's not too often you see grown men cry during a war movie. It was uh, completely immersive, breathtaking. It's, without a doubt, my favorite war epic since Saving Private Ryan. Wow. Going even farther back to my top five of all time. I was telling the guys earlier, this is a movie that I'll be watching um, at least 30 times. Wow, wow. thank you. You've watched it more than me. Yeah, it, it's just <laughs> absolutely incredible. Thank you, that's very <laughs> kind. That's really generous of you. So growing up, one of my favorite things as a child was uh, sitting down with my grandfather, and he shared with me his World War II uh, memories yeah, yeah. and childhood, like growing up. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share what that experience was like with you sitting down with your grandfather, Lance Corporal Alfred Mendez, yeah. and like what that meant for you to create this story. Well, it was a, I suppose it was a life-changing moment, although at the time I didn't probably know that, you know. And for years, people say, oh, you must have been wanting to tell this story for years. But the truth is, I didn't because they always felt like his stories, not mine. You know, I didn't feel like they were my stories to tell. Um, but he was... Then in his 70s, he was a very, uh, he was a big personality, funny, warm. He was a little deaf, so he would shout all the time, you know. And um, we all just loved him. And he was, he was a great uh, storyteller. And um, he never told his stories of the First World War to his own children, though. And uh, it was only in his 70s that he first opened up. And we all used to pester him about it. Uh, we noticed that his, um, he used to wash his hands incessantly and we would laugh um, until our, my dad told me that um, it's because he remembered the mud of the trenches and the fact that he could never get clean. And uh, that really just, I think it intrigued us all. And so we pestered him until he told us the stories <clears throat> and he told us many. Um, most of them though were not obviously heroic. They were not about bravery. You know, he won two medals, but he didn't really tell us how he won the medals. They were more about how lucky he was to have been alive and how how many moments of coincidence and chance and uh, just random pieces of luck that, that, that saved him and stopped him from dying like his friends who all died alongside him. Um, told his story about his uh, best friend who he enlisted with who, who was hit di directly by a shell standing next to him in the trench and just disappeared. There was nothing left to bury. Um, and those, when you're 11, when you hear those stories, I suppose, you know, um, they're always going to stay with you. And I had one little image that he told me, which is that he told us about carrying a message across no man's land. And he was a very small man. And uh, they sent him because the mist used to hang at six feet. Um, and he could get in under the mist without being spotted. So um, that image, really, of just that little man alone in that misty landscape at dusk, that was the fragment that became this movie. And then I enlarged it and developed it and, you know, we created this long narrative. But that was the, the reason that, that was the little bit that wouldn't let me go. 
filming this, um, it feels so immersive. And uh, I mean this in a very positive way, but it felt claustrophobic. You know, you're just, you, you feel like you're there in no man's land. And I think that's why it had such an, an emotional, you know, response for me. Yeah. When was the decision made when you sat down with Roger Deakins, the cinematographer, to to tell the story and the narrative that you have it to where it is continuous? Yeah. Well, uh, right from the beginning, I wanted it to be two hours of real time. And I wanted to feel like we were you know, in in a ticking clock thriller, effectively, that's what it is. I wanted the audience to feel every second passing and take every step with the actors, breathe every breath with the characters. Um, and I wrote it on the front page of the script. So when I sent the script to Roger Deakins, it said, this movie is designed and written to be one continuous shot. And um, so it was always part of the material because I felt like the best way to tell that is to lock the audience in with the characters. Sometimes it's claustrophobic, but other times... You know they're quite, you know it's quite it's quite epic. You see them very small in a vast landscape. Sometimes you want to understand the geography, the distance they have to travel, the physical difficulty, how far they still have to go, um, and at other times you want to just be completely connected to them and 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 see them reacting to something which you don't even see. So those that dance of the camera and the characters and the landscape, all three of which are moving all the time, that was the language of of our particular film, and that we had to try and develop over a number of months. Working with George and Dean, casting them, um, obviously did a great job carrying the film, but what I thought was interesting is you chose two actors that are relatively new. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, some people may recognize them from some of their previous works, but I think in the long run, most audiences, this is gonna be the first time they yeah, see them on screen. Yeah. yeah, I wanted two young faces. First of all, I wanted young actors. And secondly, I love the idea that an audience wouldn't know them from any pre wouldn't really know them from any previous iterations would know where they're going to live or die you know in a way i'm saying these are two men amongst two million and um lean in and you'll find out a little bit more about them but they're not obviously heroic they're not special in any particular way i mean as you get to know them you realize they are in their own way but only in the way that everyone is you know when you begin to learn about the little things that matter to them so I, f I felt it was right that they should be two actors who, who weren't that well known. But then I wanted to populate the rest of the movie, you know, with, with figures of authority and the people they meet, who, who in a way they're intersecting with lives that are much bigger than their own, are people like Colin Firth and Benedict Cumberbatch, Mark Strong, Richard Madden, Andrew Scott. And, you know, they're famous because they're really good and I wanted the best actors I could possibly find to play those roles. And luckily they all said yes. Yeah. So you have an unusual thing where it's the unknown actors that are taking you through the movie and the known actors are the people that they meet. Christy, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Oh, it's lovely to meet you too. So I was telling the guys how immersive this movie is for me and I, for the audience as well. But not only that, that it's my favorite war film since Saving Private Ryan. Oh my God. Last, and I was thinking Jarhead. So a buddy of mine was like, well, what about Jarhead? I was like, well, that's Sam Mendes and yeah, Roger Deakins you know, as well. Yeah, so yeah. I think I can say that he, 1917 he is mind. better. He won't than mind Jarhead. that you like this more. Like, I think this is his new favorite child. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so when he approached you, with creating this story, what was that like? Like, how did all that come to be? Um, so we had worked together a couple of times. In fact, I first started out in Penny Dreadful, which he produced. Uh, and we had two other projects that fell apart because of rights issues. So he phoned me up one day. I'm in my pajamas, typing away, as you do. It's very glamorous, being yeah. a screenwriter. And um, you see Sam Mendes. So I answered the call right away. I was like, hello, first string. Uh, and he's like, hey, it's me. Third time's the charm. I have this idea. I want to write it with you. So I'm like, already, I'm like so on board. And then he told me it's a World War One movie. And he had no idea that I was, I grew up fascinated by the war. So I've had like a, a kind of dearth of knowledge, um, like a real nerd. Um, and then the last thing he said in that call was, oh, by the way, it's all going to be one shot. And then he hung up on me. <laughs> Because I was just, so I was left kind of bewildered, like, did I hear that right? I couldn't have heard that right. But I did. I texted him, I made sure. And so th that's how it started. And he's he's an amazing collaborator. Like, he's an incredible director and he's a visionary. But he's also irritatingly talented at writing as well. He sat down the first day and I was like, oh, you know, he's never done this before. And right off the bat, I was like, well, you're good at this. Yeah. Annoying. <laughs> So I was going to ask you, like, being a continuous shot, does that change the way that you perceive it when you're writing? Yeah, I mean, it changes everything about the script. Uh, it's really tricky. There's two problems to it. The first is you have to think of it as a story in real time. And there's just a natural kind of, like, boundary as how fast you can push, push real time before the audience go, oh, no, I don't believe that would all happen in the space of 
90 minutes or in the space of one day. So that's like the first challenge. So you're basically walking a tightrope. And then the other challenge is the script has to read instead of being like a traditional script, which is a map or a blueprint to a movie, this had to read like the actual movie. It had to read like the final film, it had to be the destination. And that just takes a huge amount of work and also collaboration because you need to work with the person who's gonna put it on screen. And so it just wouldn't have been possible without Sam. So you're walking a tightrope and you're doing it in a hurricane is how I would describe it. <laughs> yeah, I think you really fall on the dialogue. Like the dialogue because becomes so important because yeah. the scenes are so long that you fall really heavily on that. And yeah. I really enjoyed like the banter that oh, the guys please. had. Thank you. Yeah, like how, how did you come up with some of that banter? Because because I know war guys, like guys in war, they like yeah. to riff on each other. Of course, but, yeah, But yeah. like the way that you... Some of it, so, so I read loads of first-hand accounts. I read loads of people's diaries and some of it is like, things you kind of like, I don't know, work their way into your subconscious as you're reading. Um, it's hard to kind of describe how you do it because I can't quite put it into words even though I'm a writer. But I think the thing with this was it had to feel like reality. It had to feel like you as the audience weren't removed at all from the story. And so there was no, we couldn't use exposition. It would stick out like a sore thumb, it'd be so obvious. How often do you wake up with like a buddy you've known for months or years and go, oh, how is your wife whose name is Martha and, yeah. and your four cats that you keep? You know what I mean? You just don't do it. It doesn't exist in real life. And, and so everything, all the dialogue had to serve as that North Star of being true to reality. So you just have to get creative and you have to think, oh, how would I, behave in this situation? How would I speak? How would we interact? And so you start off from that and then what helps is you have two incredible actors. And so like with Dean Charles and George, I was in six months of rehearsals and we were constantly refining the dialogue so it felt completely natural coming out their mouths. What was it like to go back to the battlefields in France? Oh, I mean, it was incredibly moving. Uh, uh, so I drove the exact route that the boys would take in the film. I, and I walked part of it because it was fields and stuff like that and they would have been very angry if I put my car through them. <laughs> um, it was so moving. I'd been to France several times growing up and I remember going there and thinking, oh, but the men that went here were soldiers, they were big men, they were grown-ups. And this time, I, you know, I was on this one mile stretch of land uh, and on this one mile there's probably five or six cemeteries for British, German, French. And um, I found myself in each of the cemeteries and I was older than every boy buried there. And so to to have that moment is like suddenly, I, I couldn't even imagine going into battle, let alone leading men into battle. And I'm 32, I, I would have probably been a bloody general uh, by that point, you know. So it's just, the concept of that is so foreign and, and it was so important to me to get that right so I could put it in the script. I think that was so shocking for me as well. I'm 32 as well. And so when I'm watching the film, I'm like, yeah. these guys are so young. Yeah. Like you're, t you're picking them out of these little country towns yeah. all throughout the UK and you're placing them in this foreign land in France. Well, that's it. And then you're like, go, like yeah. jump over the berm and- Yeah, and hope know, for the best. And hope for the best. And, that, and the thing is, is like, I think no one knew what they were getting into with World War I. Um, and if you think about, I mean, the effect it had in Britain, so many people, so many men died, entire generation was lost. There's a, a famous quip, quote by Vera Britton who wrote Testament of Youth, and after the war she wrote, every boy I'd ever danced with was dead. And that was true. Like, you know, men disappeared, women were left behind in, in this human wreckage. And so to, to try and put that into film is almost impossible. I can't write a movie in which you care about six million men dying in the mud. But what I can do is write something character driven in which you care about a few men dying, or which I hope you do. It was uh, absolutely beautiful, breathtaking. And uh, this is a movie I was telling everybody else, I'm gonna see it probably 30 times throughout my life. Like, it's truly incredible, so. Well, that's, that's incredibly touching, thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. Oh, what a pleasure. <laughs>